This minimalist wants more. Enoughism is about having enough already. I'm Yugen Bond, host and author of Enoughism, a show changing modern perceptions of mindfulness and meditation. For more, follow me at I Am Enoughism and visit IamEnoughism.com. I'm here with empath and life coach Julian Richard from TheWayToYourPurpose.com. Julian started meditating when he was 16, and he's here to discuss what it's like being an empath and how meditation sparks compassion. Let's talk about being an empath. So what does that mean for you in your life? It means being able to pick up on other people's emotions. It's almost as if they they were your own. It's very easy to read other people, to basically look behind whatever they're projecting or whatever they're they're uh, portraying themselves as. It's very easy for me to to see their true self. When did you first start to realize you had an ability to read people and kind of dig deeper, I guess, into people's emotions and what they're feeling? I always had it, but I never really put a name to it. It's later in my life where I started to read up on the topic and I began to realized that there's a community of people, that there's a lot of people like this, and that there is an actual name for it. But for me, it's just it's always been my, my experience. And do you use it as a tool in any way, especially when you meet new people and just kind of interacting and navigating the complexity of human emotions? Of course, at times, it has been a blessing and a curse, because you are so, so able to read what people are sending out, so to speak. But at the same time, you are very receptive to, to that. So it is it's a blessing in the sense that you're able to generate a lot of compassion and empathy for other people. You're able to get a sense of who they are. You, you get a sense of what they're going through and what, what kind of struggles they're dealing with. And this is great because, because it opens up this shared space of, of connection that becomes possible. But at the same time, you're also extremely, or at least I am extremely open and receptive to the pain, the suffering that's, that's also out there. And that you, you just can't put up a shield. You just just exposed to it right and this is also what, what motivates me to then go forward and to to help those people right yeah because it's picking up on the good and the bad is there an example of someone you've come across where it was a particularly memorable interaction or experience where you were able to maybe pick up on something maybe where they weren't or where you were able to kind of read something and, and help them through? Yeah, I, I guess I've always been someone who was able to be authentic with people so that they didn't have to present themselves as something that they think they have to, but what they actually are, who they actually are. I think I've always been someone who, who allowed other people to, to be authentic because authenticity is something that I value for myself as well. So it's always been my experience. It's not really one experience in particular. It's just the standard, this kind of authentic communication and connection. And something that I just personally, I, I can't do is, is be inauthentic, is, is to, to be polite and to just go with the norm, the convention of what you have to say. When I realize or when I notice that there's something else going on underneath and, and it's hard for me to, to then stick to this, the script of the social norm. Yeah, small talk is exhausting anyway for a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you talk about authenticity and kind of digging below the surface, you know, many people present themselves 
in a way that is not true to who they are. I think it was Jim Carrey, if I remember correctly, who said something like depression, for example, is really about how you're kind of living your life as an avatar, where you're, yeah. you're kind of going through the motions of who you think you should be. And there's a big gap in between who you really are and what would really make you happy. And then how you're living your day to day and what your kind of everyday grind looks like. And does that relate to you? Yes, absolutely. That is what I want to achieve with my coaching. So I am uh, becoming a coach and my goal is actually to put people in touch with that authentic self. It's to, to really step into that quality because I, I see that quality in, in everyone. I see everyone as kind of like a unique spark and I see the beauty that everyone has in their uniqueness. And that is what I want to encourage people to step into and to realize how valuable that actually is. And that they, they don't have to, to stick to what other people expect of them, but they should, should listen to that inner voice and, and to, to actualize that, yeah, that, that unique spark and that genius that everyone has in their own way. Yeah, totally. And that reminds me of, there's this meditation practice I used to do, like around New Year's, kind of, you know, time of rejuvenation and kind of reflection on your life and your big goals. And you take something that you want to achieve that you could do to make you happy, whether that's, oh, I want to move out of the country into the city or vice versa. I want to move out of the city into the country. That would make me happy, whatever it is. And then you make a list, even if it's just two or three things of reasons that you tell yourself why you can't do that. Oh, I can't do that because I have a lot of stuff and it's too much of a pain for me to move right now. Or, oh, I can't do that because I have a job here and I would have to get a new job and all these things where if you wanted to, you could change them and they don't necessarily stand in your way. I guess what I'm trying to say is there are blockages in our minds that prevent us from kind of living our best life. And do you think that we kind of lose ourselves? along the way and we just kind of go along this path and it's not our path maybe it's someone else's maybe we think it's ours but really it's just kind of societal norms holding us down i think it, it varies from from person to person what what i've noticed or what i believe is that when we're younger we are spontaneously more in tune with with that side of ourselves and we we allow ourselves more to to express that like spontaneously but I think that yeah in many cases or probably in most cases we believe that we have to fulfill a certain norm in order to function in the world right and so we have to somehow discard that that spark that we once had but if we realize that we could find back to that then our lives could be could be much more fulfilled. And I think in some unique instances, it isn't the case that, that someone loses it. Like people like, um, you, you mentioned Jim Carrey earlier, and I think yeah. Jim is, is an example of someone who, who really uh, is allowing himself to, to, to let that shine through. And I think that's, that's why, why people like him. It, it, it's exactly because he's allowing himself to, to not listen to outside pressures, but to just let that light shine through from within. Um, I'd say it takes some courage to, to step into that because you aren't getting any, any reinforcement from outside in many cases. There's no one telling you how to do this. Well, I'm here to tell you how to do it, but uh, <laughs> everyone has to, to find that way in the end, and yeah, it's also it's a very vulnerable thing to do, you know. Oh, totally. So, when it comes to kind of changing your inner dialogue and changing your relationship with yourself and also with the world around you, 
how does the average person go about doing that? Is it about kind of changing your environment and the external factors that shape who you are? Is it about changing your inner dialogue and using different words where you can kind of rewrite your life and kind of shift the direction you're going in? We already know what it is. Um, but what we're lacking is, is courage because we're afraid of, of, being, of being judged or we're afraid of not being accepted. So we have this, this knowledge inside of ourselves. And I think that, that we're, we're being authentic in, in many cases. We're allowing ourselves to, to be authentic in certain situations or when we're on our own, when we're in our own thoughts. But we're, we don't allow ourselves to, to take that to the outside. You know, we, we don't allow ourselves to, to really go into the world as this person, being this person. So I think what it takes is the encouragement to realize that this treasure, this, this thing that you have inside yourself, that you, you know you have, that this is valuable and that people will like that. And people actually want to see that from you. So I think it's less a matter of finding what it is. It's more a matter of drawing it out and living it out and having the courage to, to really step into it and, and live it out. Yeah, that makes sense. Kind of like just stripping down the noise and realizing that it's already there and it's, it's already within all of us we just have to kind of let it breathe and give it some room to blossom and grow and related to that idea of kind of blossoming and growing I know that meditation has a big part in your life and the enough as in podcast you know covers kind of three key pillars meditation mindfulness and minimalism and they're all very much related but to focus on that one pillar of meditation, it seems like there's a really strong connection, at least from my own brain, as I hear you talk about this, about meditating and kind of letting that inner light shine through and giving it space. Tell me a little bit about that and, and where the connection lies. Well, my, my journey of meditation has been I don't know if there's a direct connection between my meditation and the intuition that I've developed, but I'd say that those, those two things could be connected. And I started meditating when I was 16. At first, I, I'd read on, on the internet, on Reddit and other sites about the benefits of meditation and what meditation could, could do for you. And at that time, I was going through a difficult time myself and I actually use meditation to to help me cope with things I was going through but quickly I realized that there is more to it there's a greater depth to be explored I, I made it a regular habit I meditated probably every day maybe 20 minutes um, these days it's not as structured it's more of a when I'm inspired to do it but it doesn't take as much force to do it now as whereas back then it took a lot of force. I I had to really pressure, really force myself to do it because it was extremely difficult for my mind to, to stay focused and to, to be content with just being with itself, which the mind is so used to not being the mind mind is used to being distracted. So yeah. I had some, some, some really extremely uh, profound experiences while meditating. What kind of experiences have you had? Well, there was one experience of extremely powerful concentration. And I got to a point where I experienced overwhelming bliss. It was probably one of the most blissful experiences I've had. So I was focusing on my breath and at some point it was almost as though it was just the breath. There was no more, there was absolutely no more thought. It was complete stillness and there was just the breath. And at some point 
the attention got so focused and so one pointed. And at that point, there was just bliss, just overwhelming bliss coming in. And I actually figured out that this is described in Buddhism as a uh, jhana. So the first jhana, it is a state of deep concentration, basically, yeah. accompanied by bliss. That's beautiful. Sounds like you were definitely tapping into something. I've had some experiences like that too. And sometimes they've taken me by surprise where I sit down to meditate and I really feel like I need it certain days because my mind is just going crazy. And it's almost like you have tunnel vision where mm -hmm. all of a sudden everything just gets quieter and quieter. And, yeah. and it's like, you could you you could try to think something and it just gets blocked it's like like a goalie yeah. or something just holding it back and then like the most pure experience of joy just pure joy you mm. can ever feel and yes yeah and and it's transformative and like for me one of my early experiences meditating was like that and I was just overwhelmed with emotion and and it changed my whole concept of my relationship with the world. And I mean, I think every person on this earth wants the exact same thing. We want to be loved. We want, we want to be happy. Yes. Although meditation gives you great benefits, I think it should be approached with, with zero expectation and the willingness to, to just sit and to allow everything to be as it is right now, which is, I think we're just not used to doing this because everything else that we do is aims at a result, right? So yeah. to just let go and to accept the moment as it is and to see it as perfect, it's quite radical. And I think one, one thing that I also has probably deepened with my meditation practice is I've always been very, as I mentioned earlier, very um, empathetic person. I think meditation has probably, probably increased that because as I meditated, I looked for the roots of my own suffering. I looked for where my own pain that I went through, where it came from. And to, to be with myself has probably opened up my um, ability to to be there for others and to be just a companion to to other people who are also going through things also have feelings and suffer in their lives yeah that takes some guts gosh to look at the inner source of your pain and and why that's there and where that comes from and addressing it head on and learning how to let that go i think Definitely. It's, yeah. it's like the root of most people's anger and, and why people live those avatar lives where they keep kind of striving for something that they'll never achieve and they always want more and more. Um, I think that you might be hitting on something really important there. Yeah, definitely. It opens your heart to, to be there for other people's suffering. Whereas if you, you're not meditating, it's more likely that you, you might just, walk past those people and not really see them. But I, I've, I've just noticed that whenever I really practice meditation, that my, my compassion really increased. I, I really began to, to care more, to, to be more present, to be more appreciative also, like be more appreciative, be more kind towards myself, be more appreciative, be more receptive to the beauty the world has to offer and to also be more empathetic for other people's experiences. Yeah, because it kind of gets you out of the bubble of your own mind. I know like Abraham Hicks, for example, always talks about contrast. And when you come across something that you don't want to see in your life, that's okay because feelings that come up through that are what redirect you towards what you want. And you wouldn't have those feelings or feel the need to be redirected if you weren't exposed to things that you didn't want or things that elicited negative emotions for you. Yeah, it's, it's contrast, right? Life wouldn't be interesting if we 
we're just given whatever our mind thinks it wants all the time. Sometimes to experience the lack of something can be a very beneficial lesson to then also be more appreciative of what, what you do have and to, to get to know all the different facets of life, the, the ups and downs and the yin and yang. So, yeah. Yeah, the yin and yang. That's it. The dark and the light, the good and the bad. You know, we're always kind of caught in the middle somewhere. Is it Eckhart Tolle? Like he has this example where you walk through, say, the park and everything that you see, you remove the name of it. So, for example, you're looking at a tree. It's not a tree. Just take the label off of it Mm -hmm. and just try to look at it for what it is with the energy, the feeling, whatever that is. And then you kind of take that. And once you've done it with a rock or a tree or the grass below you, you can start doing that to yourself. But there are all these preconceived labels that we give ourselves. But if you kind of strip that away, who are you? And you're still the exact same person. You just don't have all these kind of labels tacked on to you. And I think that might be the key too, to kind of freeing your mind a little bit and redirecting yourself to where you want to go. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a, that's, that's a great insight um, that we are so used to this. I think it could potentially be a little bit frightening to, to let go of that because, because it gives a, a lot of structure, but I think it's, it's important to realize, as you said, the, the essence of what's underneath the overlay of our everyday life, the experiencing the, the beingness or the, the doing of this, this whole experience. Yeah, that's a great word to live in your beingness. That really is kind of the secret of life. Yes, absolutely. Sometimes, um, I think I, I'm, I'm able to see myself in the other or to see life as, as a play of form. So, so to see that everything is, it's connected, it's, it's one, but also at the same time, it's, it's separated because it wants to experience itself in, in, in all of its different facets and i'm i'm one of these facets and you are one of these facets but in the end it's still one yes and seeing yourself and someone else that's essentially the purpose of of meditation and everything yeah i'm just this drop inside (laughs) of this huge ocean but i'm also the ocean itself i'm not the little me i'm not this separate ego, but that I'm actually a lot bigger and that I'm connected to everything. Well, Julian, thank you so much. For-